and welcome to Wellspring Worship Online. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Karen Morton and I'm one of the pastors here at Wellspring. And a happy Mother's Day to all you mothers who are watching or listening with us. Now, let's join together for a time of worship. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Because fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide. I'm not a captive to the lies And I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken No, because fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power in your name, power in your name. Cause fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Cause fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. No fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Standing on the rock I'm standing in your love Thank you, Jesus. We thank you so much for being that rock for us, that rock that your love brings to us, God. We have a living hope because of what you did for us on Calvary. You know, there's in Ecclesiastic, it talks about a false hope, a hope that you grab onto that's fleeting. It's like smoke. It just dissipates in your hands. But that's not the hope you bring, God. You brought a living hope to us when you died because of the love that you had for the whole world. And because of that, we can have that love within us. And your living hope will be within us as we accept you, Jesus, into our hearts. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain 
I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living
Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time of taking our eyes off ourselves and putting them onto Jesus. Let's take a moment now to pray, and I'd like to invite you all to pray with me for all the moms who are watching or listening. If there's a mom in your home, take time to pray for her, or a mom in your life, a sister, or someone who's been a mom. Let's pray for them. Lord, we thank you for all the moms who tirelessly give of themselves to protect and to nurture their children, and for all the moms in our own lives who have given us time, attention, material blessings, advice, and have taught us as we've grown. Thank you for the earthly vision we have of your nurturing character expressed in the love of moms. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. In honor of Mother's Day, I would like to take a moment to honor all the moms who are listening and thank you for all you've given and sacrificed. Not all of us are moms, but we all had a mom that gave birth to us, and we remember and thank them for giving us life. Some of us weren't raised by our birth mom, and we thank the moms who did raise us, the aunts, sisters, grandmothers, friends, and adoptive moms who spent days and nights caring for us. The heart of a mother is dear to God. The Bible says that Jesus longed to gather his people as a hen gathers her chicks. Jesus is protective of his people like a hen is protective of her offspring, and that trait is very important to him. God has placed protective, nurturing people in our lives to care for us, us throughout life, and we thank God for all the moms we've known who've gathered both their biological and adoptive chicks under their wings and sheltered us from many storms and trials. So thank you, moms. And please join with me as we watch this special video tribute to moms. Come on, sweetie. Oh, honey, you've got, you've got something on your face. Mom. Did you brush your teeth? Did you really brush your teeth? Let me smell your breath. Mom! Hey, okay, Jake, honey, this is the only thing I can find, all right? <laughs> Mom! Yeah, it's a compound fracture. <sighs> I'm sorry, 
sweetheart. You're gonna be okay. Mom? Well, you have a good set of crutches? <sighs> Seriously, Jake, what am I going to do with you? Mom. Hi, Jake. Hi. Ooh, she's really cute. Mom. Mom? Mom. Jake, sit up straight, honey. Mom. something on your face. Mom. Hope you all have a wonderful Mother's Day. And now, let's bring up Tim for a time of announcements. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today with us at Wellspring. Uh, if you're watching Sunday at 9 a.m., welcome, especially to you. Maybe give a shout out in the chat. And if you're not, if you're joining us later maybe, whether on our site or on YouTube or CATV, consider tuning in next Sunday at 9 a.m. to be together with the rest of Wellspring. Also, if you're new to our community or if you've never filled in a Connect card, you can do that now via the link in the description below. Connect groups are going strong. We currently have nine groups going on, but we are actually looking for more. So if you have any ideas for an online group, email groups at wellspringworship.org. You can connect with your Wellspring friends during the week. Every weekday, we have a call-in prayer line from 5.30 to 6 o'clock. And you can just call in using that number down below and pray with us. We're also making a daily devotional for you to watch. Check that out on our Facebook or Instagram or in your email. We do have a few things going on today as well. First off, for the kids out there, we want you to tune in today for two different kids' classes happening live on Zoom. First off, we've got a class for kindergarten to second grade from 10 to 1020. And then we've got a class for third to fifth graders from 1030 to 11. And finally, we've got our regular Kids Zone video going on too. And all that is in the links in the description below. For the adults out there, we'd love for you to join us for a post-service discussion with Pastor Craig from 11 to 11.30 on Zoom. Links down below. Finally, to give to Wellspring, follow the Give link in the video description or on our site. This is the easiest and really the best way to give. If you do want to send a check, however, the address is on the screen. And now let's bring up our lead pastor, Craig Morton, for this week's message. Hey, Well Spring, this is Pastor Craig here. I'm so excited to open up the Word of God to you here this morning. You know, we're in a crisis. And how do you maintain your health in a time of crisis? When things change and things shift, you know, we're in a different season and a different time. And how do you stay healthy? Well, you need some spiritual nutrients. We need some spiritual vitamins. And um, we're going to look at that here this morning, what, what that really looks like and what that means and whatnot. And as a charismatic church, like Wellspring is, many times we can get into the place where, you know, if I just can have a fresh encounter with Jesus, I'm going to be healthy. And I tell you what, I love fresh encounters with Jesus as much as anybody. But God has actually created and determined multiple delivery systems in our lives for us to have spiritual health. There isn't just one system, there's multiple. And when we're in a time of isolation or stay at home, uh, we need to look at what some of those systems are in terms of healthy practices and vitamins, spiritual vitamins uh, in our lives. You know, you need every vitamin in your body to be healthy. And if you have vitamin C, but you're lacking vitamin D, there's a condition called rickets that you'd get. 
And back in the day when sailors would sail across the oceans, they had a lot of vitamin D because of the sunlight, but they, had, they were lacking in vitamin C and they'd end up getting a disease called scurvy. So different vitamins supply health in different ways to our physical bodies and in the same way so it does for our spiritual bodies. I'm just going to start off with a list here of spiritual vitamins that God has provided for us. Vitamin A, we're just going to call attending services. And yes, we're attending these online and we know we're coming into your house or into your home right now. But tell you what, you need this vitamin in your life. We're, if you go months and months and months without ever participating in a worship service with a group of believers, you're lacking something in your life. That's vitamin A. How about vitamin B? Reading the scriptures, Bible reading, getting into some kind of program, reading through a, gospel, a book of the Gospels, reading through a, uh, one of the epistles from St. Paul or the book of Psalms or whatnot, being in some kind of routine of going through the Scriptures is very powerful. There's nothing like memorizing Scripture and studying Scripture to renew your mind. Here's vitamin C, communion. How about taking communion at home? How about taking, this is like vitamin C in our lives. It's not complicated. You can just take a little piece of bread or a cracker. You can take some grape juice or some wine if you feel led. And just take a few moments and say, Lord, I'm just going to remember what you did for me. I'm going to remember your love and your sacrifice on the cross. And just take a moment to commune with the Lord at home. Vitamin D, devotional prayer. We have prayer meetings every night at 530, every weeknight. And I'll tell you what, they're just really encouraging to connect with other people in prayer. We just need these different vitamins in our lives. Vitamin E, encountering God. I mentioned just fresh encounters with God, just going through our life. We need encounters with God. That's vitamin E. Vitamin F is fellowshipping with one another. It's, it's a little bit of a challenge right now to fellowship and have community, but we need to find ways to do that online. When I think of community and fellowship, Sometimes I think of the analogy of geese that are flying and you know the formation they use, that V formation and the uh, aerodynamic engineers, when they looked at that, they found, as you might know, they found that a wind tunnel gets created and there's some lift that one goose then passes to the goose behind him. And uh, uh, these geese can fly 70% further when they're in this formation than a single geese or a single goose can fly on their own. So listen, if you want to go 70% further in your life, in your Christian walk, and in your walk with God, you want to be doing it with other people. You want to be connected and uh, out of isolation. And tell you what, we're trying to find ways to do that more and more online. But let's stay connected. Let's stay in fellowship with other people during this time. Okay, vitamin G, generosity. We want to stay in a place of generosity with our time and our talents. And, and, and our resources and whatnot, critical vitamin H. I'm just making ones up near how as I go down the, the alphabet here, helping other people, getting our minds off of just our own little lives and onto helping other people. Vitamin I, inspirational worship. Listen, you, you've got an internet connection. If you go to YouTube or go to someplace online and just type in uh, Christian worship and find a set list that you like, oh my goodness, I do this on a daily basis. I just find music I'm into. I'm in my house alone. I crank it up. It's just, a, it's just such a life-giving time. Vitamin I, inspirational worship. Vitamin J, the joy of the Lord. We're not talking about happiness in this vitamin. We're not talking about when things go your way, you can be happy. We're talking about regardless of what's going on, there's joy that can come in our lives through the Holy Spirit. That's vitamin J in our lives. Vitamin K is being kingdom-minded as a church, as Wellspring. We're not just our own little kingdom. We're actually sowing and giving around the world and to local ministries here and, and building the kingdom of God beyond this region. And that's vitamin K. And the last one I want to list, and we're going to go into detail on this one, is vitamin L, the love of God. And let me just tell you, um, I suspect many of us, when you hear that term, the love of God, say, yeah, we don't need to hear another sermon on that. You know, I heard that in Sunday school an awful lot. I've heard 100 sermons on it, and I've heard it a thousand times. Uh, can we just maybe move on to something a little more profound and a little more engaging and all that sort of thing? But let me just tell you what, we can't get our minds around this topic. This topic is so broad, it's so deep, and we're just going to look into what that means. In fact, vitamin L is sort of like a multivitamin. It sort of contains all the other vitamins in it. And, and similarly in a way that, that like white light 
could be looked upon as love. And when that white light hits a certain prism, it then breaks out into all the different forms of light. Love is a lot like that. Contained in it is all kinds of amazing things. We just need a good dose of vitamin L. I'll tell you what, every once a year or twice a year, I just have to give a message on the love of God. It's so fundamental and foundational. So I'm just going to move into that here right now. Uh, you know, the psalmist says this in Psalm 103, that as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love towards, towards those who fear him. So there, there's a little bit of a measurement involved here. And you know, back in the day when they wanted to see further and further into the universe, and even today, they just build bigger telescopes or they send the telescopes up into orbit and they do all sorts of things. And this is what they find. No matter how far you look into space, it goes further. It just goes further. And the analogy that the Lord uses here in Psalm 103, that as far as the heavens are above the earth, that's the kind of love that I have for my people. So if you experience the love of God in an authentic way, you're never going to conclude, you know, I've been there, I've done that, and I can check it off the list. What you're going to conclude is there is always more. It's always pointing to something further beyond. You know, it's one of the most important dimensions of the love of God is that there's no end to it. It just keeps going and going and going. And tell you what, if you get even a little glimpse of that in your life, in the midst of that time, you're going to come away thinking like this. Um, it's never going to be boring in heaven. When you encounter that and experience that, it's never going to be boring. Folks, I'm just looking forward to more and more. Here's what the Apostle Paul has to say about that kind of love in Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, he says, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Listen, um, let me just highlight a couple parts of this first because we can break it down for a minute here. Notice uh, early on he says we need power. We need power to actually begin to grasp this love of God. Right? It takes spiritual power. It's not something that just comes to our thinking. It's not something we can just begin to reason out. If we're left to our own natural way of thinking. What we're going to conclude is either we can't grasp it at all, the height and the depth and how long and how wide. Uh, either we can't grasp it at all or we're going to totally misunderstand it. And that's how it ends up working in my life. It takes supernatural power to understand this. When we begin to understand Christ's love, when we begin to understand that however low you go, he's lower. However high you go, that love is higher. However wide you go, his love is wider than that. When you begin to grasp a little bit of that, you're beginning to scratch the surface that you can't really get away from it. And the last part of the verse there says, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge. If, if, if we begin to experience that love that surpasses knowledge, we're beginning to get a little bit of a clue of what his love is really like. What I'm really trying to say here in terms of this verse is this, that the true gospel requires supernatural power to understand it. All other forms of the gospel are really believable on their own set of terms. So when we hear the real gospel, there has to be something so uh, enamoring about it and so beautiful about it and so incredible about it that it takes God's power to really help us understand. It surpasses knowledge. Without any ifs, ands, or buts, or qualifications, we begin to see that the love of God is really much, much greater and deeper than we ever thought. But our problem is this. Our problem is that there's some distortion in our lives. Because, you know, we're, we're messed up. We're all, to some degree, messed up in this. And, and we've been associated with love in different ways. And it can happen a million different ways. Maybe your dad, um, as you grew up, said, you know, I love you, son or daughter. But um, he was never around. And so that, that phrase, I love you, was actually associated with detachment. Or maybe your parents said, we love you so much, we love you. And they got divorced as you were a small child. And... You felt abandoned and, and you somehow associated love with abandonment. Or perhaps uh, as you grew up, you know, you, your parents were there and they said, I love you, I love you. But around second or third or fourth grade, you began to realize that, hmm, it seems like my mom and dad's love for me goes up and down depending on my performance, depending on how well I did at that gymnastics meet or on this homework assignment or on cleaning my room or this musical instrument that I play, or whatever it is, you begin to determine that, hey, love is 
conditional and you think, oh, that's what love is. Now, now I'm beginning to get it. Or it could be even worse than that. Someone can say, I love you, and in the midst of that, they can uh, beat you up for doing the wrong things or abuse you in different ways. So we can grow up thinking that love gets associated with detachment or love gets associated with performance or love gets associated with abuse. And then we're told that God is love. And when we think that, we think, boy, that's not necessarily good news that God is love if our view of love is all screwed up and then we impose that view upon God. You know, the word gospel means good news and God's good news is really, really, really good news. In fact, God can make up for all those deficits that each one of us have, right? Every one of our parents had brokenness in certain areas or in certain ways, but our Heavenly Father, through His love, wants to make up for those deficits. You know, the gospel, if we hear it correctly, it should just blow us away. It should, it should blow our minds. We should begin to feel like, well, is that, can that really be true? If the gospel is something simple to understand and something we can just deduce, the Apostle Paul said you actually need spiritual power to understand it. Maybe that's not really the true form of the gospel. See, many of us have heard, and I suspect maybe most of us, have heard a kind of uh, the gospel that really doesn't require any supernatural understanding to grasp it. Does this sound familiar to you a little bit? Going something like this. God created Adam and Eve in the garden. Um, he put a tree in that garden to test them. They failed the test and he got really mad at them and he kicked them out of the garden and he's been mad really ever since. And he thought, well, maybe the way I can rectify humanity and sin is I'll work through this nation called Israel. And uh, he gave one rule to Adam and Eve, but then he gave a whole bunch of rules to Israel and they couldn't keep those rules. And then he got furious uh, with them even more so. And finally, God sends his one and only son into the world. That one and only son takes all the fury and wrath of God upon himself. God punishes Jesus so that we don't go to hell. Now, does that sound familiar to you as a form of the gospel? And we could just say with this slide saying, God's wrath was aimed at you, but Jesus took it for you. And you might say, well, yeah, that really is the gospel, and that's what I was learned as a child, and is there any problem with that? And, you know, the, the only problem with that is it doesn't take any supernatural understanding to embrace it. it. It's just a deduction, and it's just a statement there, and it has a vague resemblance of some things in Scripture, but I think it's a little bit distorted, because it doesn't capture the beauty and the awe and the goodness of what the good news and the love of God really is. You know, oftentimes we hear that the good news is that Jesus died for our sins, and that is 100% the case. But if we stop there only and don't realize that actually the love of God and the gospel of God came to restore a relationship like Jesus had with the Father, that we're meant to have that same relationship with God. This is what it says in John chapter 14 when Jesus is speaking with his disciples. He says this, familiar verse to some of us, I am the way and the truth and the life. And he says this, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the way, but the Father is the destination for that way. The eternal destination. The whole end goal is to get to the Father, according to this verse. And there's a lot of times where, you know, we might have this image of the Father. He's mad at us. He's angry at us. Jesus took the wrath. And there can be a lot of burning out in the Christian life. And, you know, have I done enough to please God? And you can walk through life wondering that. Have I really done enough? But let me tell you, when you come in touch and in contact with the love of God, there is tremendous rest that comes into your soul because you realize, boy, uh, th there's not anything I can do that can make him love me more or anything I can do to make him love me less. And so when that love of God really gets revealed, that supernatural power of revelation, not just some deduction in our minds, but God coming to us and revealing it to us, incredible shifts take place in our spirit. And speaking of shifts, I just want to shift gears here in, in the halfway through this message and get into the second half. And I want to look at some of the misunderstandings and what I think are some of the cruxes of the misunderstandings between the, the, the scriptural view of the good news and the love of God coming to us, and maybe some that aren't so scriptural. And uh, the way I think that's best to describe that is through comparing a contract versus a covenant. A contract and a covenant can look very similar, but in fact they are quite different. 
And if you understand the difference between a contract and a covenant, I think that'll give us some enlightenment in our spirit between the difference between the real true version of the gospel and one that's, that's lacking and limited in some ways. See, one of the byproducts, I believe, of the fall in the garden with Adam and Eve was a converting of our understanding of our relationship with God into a contract mode versus a relational covenant mode. In fact, let me just start with some differences. A contract is all about a legal framework, but a covenant is all about a relational framework. And so here's one of the issues uh, that, that we see in Christianity through, throughout history is that many of the theologians that developed Christian theology, and it's great theology to be sure, but many of them were trained in the law and they were either lawyers or just had training in the law. And that's true of Martin Luther, that's true of John Calvin, that's true of a bunch of them. And so the paradigm with which they saw our relationship with God was more of a God as the judge and we're the guilty defendant. Now, does the Bible talk like in those terms? Well, yeah, it talks in those terms, but that metaphor is never meant to be the central metaphor. And, and so sometimes theologians have made that more of the central metaphor that um, we just have this legal arrangement with God and God's the judge and we've got to get cleared versus a loving relationship like we see way back in the Garden of Eden. So there's, that's one difference. Here's another difference. That, that a contract is really like a purchase agreement of a house or a purchase agreement for a car or an employment agreement to work. But a covenant is like a marriage. And so uh, if you want to compare uh, the difference between buying a car and being married, that would be sort of the difference between a contract and a covenant. See, a contract is, is self-centered and self in, involving self-interest and consumer thinking. And what's in it for me and how can I get out of that? And, but in a covenant, you ask totally different questions. In, in a covenant, if you ask this question, honey, um, how often in a marriage covenant, how often can I cheat on you, honey, before you'll divorce me? See, when we're thinking like that, we're not in a covenant at all. We're in a contract agreement. In a covenant, you're asking questions like, how can we get closer? And how can we remove these obstacles that are in the way for our relationship? And how can we actually grow together as a couple? See, it's all about the relational side. So I'm just going to go down a list here of contract versus covenant. How about this one? A, a contract is more like a, a deal that you get. And you're always looking for the best deal, and you want the right deal. Uh, but a covenant is like pledging yourself to somebody else. So you pledge your whole self. And a deal just occurs between two people, but a pledge just involves the whole person. I'm pledging myself to you. Uh, like in marriage, you pledge your whole life and your spirit and soul. You just say, Lord, I I'm just giving myself to you. I'm giving myself to this person. The difference between a deal and a pledge. How about this one? We talked about law a little bit. Contracts and covenants, the difference between a law and the love of God. And the best way to look at this is when we look back in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, we see it wasn't a bunch of laws that God put on Adam and Eve, right? We see, we get a glimpse that at the cool of the day, God would come in the afternoon and Adam and Eve would walk with God and they would enjoy God and God would enjoy them. And that was what it was all about. It wasn't about the rules and the law. And there are certainly conditions in a covenant arrangement, but those conditions are there to protect the value of the covenant, not to lay down a bunch of rules and laws. And here's the last contrast between a contract and a covenant. Conditional is a contract and unconditional is a covenant. You know, there's terms of a contract, right? And contracts are always conditional. And those terms are this. If you break the terms, then the whole thing is off. But a covenant is about a, a, a pledging yourself to a spouse, giving yourself for better or for worse is the agreement. And God intends his arrangement of a covenant to be like a marriage. And regarding marriage, you know, sometimes people might abuse uh, certain privileges and say, well, how far can I go with this? Or what can I get away with? But um, the Lord's answer that isn't slapping on more rules. The Lord's cure for sin isn't more threats. It's really encountering the love of God. It's really changing us from the inside and the motivation. And, and speaking of that, here's another example of this in Scripture. When the angel comes to Mary and Joseph and says, hey, you're going to conceive and, and Jesus is going to be born from your womb, the angel um, says this to Joseph. He says, hey, you're going to give him the name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. 
And so when you think of that for a minute, what he's not saying is he's going to save his people from the consequences and the punishment of sin, right? The angel was talking about something much deeper, like he's going to save them from their self-centeredness and from the junk in their lives and from their hatred and lust and darkness and every evil part of the human race. He's going to come and take that out. And see, so in the contract approach to, to the love of God, um, you're just trying to get saved from the consequences of sin without actually getting saved from the things that led to those consequences. See, when we see everything through a legal, legal framework, we just want to get off the hook, right? We want to get acquitted and get off the hook. And, you know, if, if you go to a, a, a courthouse and you're uh, there as a defendant, you're just really looking to get free. And, and get a good deal out of the thing. And, you know, when we see God primarily as a judge, no one's looking to hang out with a judge at the end of the day. I had a traffic violation a couple of years ago. I went to the courthouse here in Lebanon and, and um, the judge found me totally innocent. And I tell you what, when, when, when he found me innocent, I didn't want to hang out there and just chat with the judge and go out for coffee with him later. I wanted to get out of that courthouse because I didn't want to give him a chance to find anything else wrong in my life. It was like, get me out of here. I'm going to move on. And when we see God primarily as a judge, I tell you what, we're going to be limited in a major way in, in, in what is reality behind the scenes. In fact, Christianity becomes a legal story then instead of a love story. It, it was always meant to be a love story. That, that, that's how we are wired. That's how we're, you see, if it's just a legal story, it takes no Holy Spirit empowerment to really believe it, right? It's just a contract that got fixed. It's just, it got broken and then it got tweaked and it's no longer a story about the love of God coming into our lives. So that version of the gospel that we have a cosmic lawyer and we have a bunch of criminals who are getting acquitted doesn't really do justice to the shepherd looking for the sheep and finding the lost sheep. Doesn't do justice to the, the prodigal son's father longing for the son to come home and rejoicing when he comes home. And see, um, you know, we get a little glimpse of that when we see Jesus on the cross. It says this about this in Hebrews chapter 12. It says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. Scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of God. It was for the joy that was set before him. And, you know, Jesus, of course, had to die for our sins because we, his people, you know, got into some trouble along the way, a lot of trouble, and he came to pay a price for that. But there was joy in his heart to do it. Right? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't as if um, once that all happened, uh, he reprimands us and said how painful it was. He actually had joy associated with the crucifixion. And why is that? It says because God so loved the world. And so here's a, a closing thought that Jesus didn't come to the earth and die because God was mad at us. Jesus came to the earth and died because God was madly in love with us. See, that's the, that's the real gospel, folks. That's the true understanding of the love of God being released. And when we realize that in our minds and begin to wrap our minds that we can't really totally comprehend that, we're starting to understand it a little bit along the way. And, um, you know, what would it look like if that kind of love was really unconditional? Or, or what would it look like if it didn't depend on our performance and, and if it was truly 100% just God for us? And I want to play a three-minute clip here of a prophetic word that a guy named Graham Cook, he's an author and speaker, gave many years back. And we've got it to a little bit of a, some background music. But it's just a, a glimpse of what the love of God is when it's 100% for you. Let's just listen to it now. The Lord says that there is nothing that you can do that would make him love you more. There is also nothing you can do that would make him love you less. He loves you because he loves you, 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 because he loves you. Because that is what he is like. It is his nature to love. And you will always be the beloved. And his love is unchanging. And he loves you 100%. He won't love you any better when you become better. He loves you 100% right now. 
And even if you have no plans to become better, He will still love you 100%. Because He loves you, because that's the way that He is. And even if you don't want to change, He will love you 100%. Even if you have no plans to walk with Him, He will love you 100%. Because that's His nature. He loves all the way, all the time. His love is unchanging. What will change, says the Lord, is your ability to receive my love. And this evening, I want to cram some more of that ability inside you. So I challenge you, says the Lord, open your heart to me. Open your heart to me. And you will receive more of my love than you've ever experienced before. I dare you, says the Lord. Come on. Open your heart to me. Give me your heart. Give me whatever your obstacle is. I'll take it. I'll remove it out of the way. Because I love you as you are right now. I love you 100% as you are right this moment. I love you as you are. So be loved. You are the beloved. It is your job, says the Lord, to be loved outrageously. It is why I chose you. That is why I set my love upon you. That you would live as one who is outrageously loved. That you would receive a radical love. So radical, it will blow all your paradigms of what you think love is. And no, says the Lord, I will love you outrageously all the days of your life. Folks, God wants to make a new paradigm for us with the law of God. He wants that outrageous goodness and love to so flow to us in a way that we'd never experienced. Let's just, let me just close here in prayer. Father, we just started today talking about different spiritual vitamins and where we came to this place where the love of God really is such the central and core thing we need. And uh, Lord, we just, we can't understand it all, but we just want to be able to rest in that love. And we're not going to try to achieve anything. We're not going to try to earn anything. We're just going to rest in the midst of that. And Lord, would you remind us today that we really do belong to you and that you're dismantling those things in our life Lord, that, that our misconceptions. Lord, you're pouring out your love into our hearts in those deficient areas. And Lord, would you continue to open our eyes? Lord, the verse we read that says, we need your power to experience the height and the depth and the length and the breadth of your love. Lord, would you just release that even right now? Help us never put limits, Lord, on the love that you have for us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. We're going to sing a closing song now about just loving Jesus, pouring out our love toward him. Let's, let's join together in this final song. Things that 
worship team and thank you to Pastor Craig and thanks to all of you for joining us. You can go back and rewatch this video at any time and please don't forget to check us out online at wellspringworship.org. Uh, look at our social media on Facebook and Instagram and if you're a Wellspring parent just go ahead and check your email for the Zoom links to the kids classes. For the adults join us at 11 for the Q&A and please don't forget to give using the links on this page. Thank you so much. Now a blessing from Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a blessed week.